like all Naga politicians, I'd like to stand rather than sit and present. Tough act to follow, but uh, try my best. I'd like to inform you that uh, yesterday was uh, the day my book hit the stands. It's called the publication day for my book. And this would be actually the first talk ever uh, I would give on uh, the book that I've recently published. And therefore, uh, you'll have to indulge me with uh, some of the opinions or reflections that I'm going to share with you on this book. I was told by Dolly that uh, I have to share about why, how I wrote this book. And therefore, in no sequence, i like to start by telling you that this is not the first book written on this particular aspect of the Naga Hills, which is the colonial history, let us say, on the Naga Hills. This will not be the first book. However, it will also uh, showcase what has not been addressed properly. And because the due attention has not been given to the narrative of the native, I felt that it was important as a calling to actually write this part of the history that people often you know, neglect or put in you know, the footnotes of uh, you know, everybody's curriculum or uh, you know, the discourse of history in the country. And especially when it comes to war history, colonial history, this part of the region is usually for, for good. In fact, uh, I had given Chuba Mila and the organizers uh, a recent review, which was uh, done by one professor uh, in the country, who is also one of the foremost military historians of India. Um, he had written many good things about it, but at the end, the conclusion was something which actually attracted my attention. As a poet, as somebody who studied literature, I'm not a trained historian. Therefore, it was exactly as he pointed out. I would defer from a historian about conclusions made about this particular chapter of our history. But the point that many people would miss is because they think this is a chapter which is not relevant in today's world. The significance of it is something which I wanted to highlight and therefore I will engage you in why and how it is significant for me and my people. The title itself is something which, starting from my kids to anybody who has heard about it, us, and you know, usually with a little bit of uh, cynicism, uh, people inquire about why you call it His Majesty's Hepatitis. Technically, as a historian, I would say in the chronological order, in 1832, uh, King William IV was on the throne of Britain and therefore when the first foray into the Naga Hills uh, you know, by the British India companies uh, started, uh, he was at the throne. And again, in 1944, in the Battle of Kohima, uh, at the throne of England was King George uh, VI, I believe. And therefore, uh, with no particular discrimination, uh, I say His Majesty's Headhunter, because it's a uh, in a way, it's a criticism of that period as well, uh, and it starts from the time. The other thing, this is by way of situating the entire framework within a, a historical context that I would uh, want to share with you. 
the siege of Kohima that shaped world history. There, there are questions about which siege of Kohima. Usually, people in the know of things, especially uh, little about Northeastern history, uh, would talk about the Battle of Kohima and the Battle of Infa. And it's in 1944. But that is just one of the siege, one of the moments when Kohima was attacked. And this time it was the Japanese Imperial Army. But if you look at the earlier parts of colonial history, especially the 19th century, you would find that when Kohima was made the political administrative headquarter of the British Empire in the, in the Naga Hills, there was two attacks on that headquarter of the British Empire by a conglomeration of the Naga villages around Kohima to retake that position. So there are two contrasting stories which uh, needed to be told and which needed to be connected. And the way I wanted to showcase history is through stories. Usually, there are so many scholars here they'll tell you that when we write, especially history, when you write about the past, we work on the shoulder of giants. So many people have written. And we are revisiting that particular literature that is available. And this revisiting took place from a native's perspective. And therefore, I feel that, you know, because we need to engage readers. I am of that school of thought which believes that my story should be read by a sixth standard student and understood by him or her so that our stories are passed on. And if you write to obfuscate and confuse the readers, you will not have achieved the you know, intended uh, ambition or, or goal that you have in writing, in the writing of the book. Also because any writer will tell you that it takes time to write. And, it, and for me, because I'm not a trained historian, I work harder than a historian so that I would be able to present the view and validate my point of view with all the uh, literature available the local narratives that I uh, listened to, the oral histories that uh, was handed down to us, and also a host of uh, written work that is available on this issue. Having said that, I will now get into some of the details that will sort of illuminate uh, the gist of what this book is about. Let's begin with Emperor Hirohito. You know, at that point of time, when he was at the height of his power, he wanted, or Japan wanted to replace, uh, you know, after the First World War, Britain as the uh, superpower, at least in this region of Asia, South Asia, South East Asia. And they had this ambition because they were supported by Germany. And you know, globally, the geopolitics of that time was different. And when I tell you this story, I wanted to get back to my main point that the Nagas who were being colonized at that point of time were not aware of this geopolitics. And it so happened for uh, more than uh, 100 years. But when the Second World War, uh, and not the Second World War, the Battle of Kohima uh, was being decided in uh, Tokyo. The hours that we decided that, you know, uh, we would not attack, Japan would not attack America or uh, uh, even Europe, but they will come and attack you know, the Southeast Asia, South Asia, which were ruled by various uh, colonial powers, the Dutch East India Company, uh, the British East India Company, and then the British Empire. The objective was to ensure that the resources available in this region 
would fall, would be captured by them, would be used by them to actually propel themselves to uh, global superpower. And it's an uh, ambition which is uh, well documented. The other factor was that Britain, Great Britain, and especially let us uh, use, uh, refer to them as the British Empire, had actually, after the First World War, realized that the power was on the way. And uh, <coughs> this particular region was then captured by Japan. Burma was uh, Burma fell uh, into the hands of Japan, and uh, the fight to retake Japan was a strategy that they uh, came up with. Because already Japan as a power was also being challenged in China, so their hold over China was also being challenged. Now, if you look at this global scenario at that point of time, and you look at what was happening in the Nagas, you would not think of the region in particular, you know, about the details within it, the history of this region. You will only think of the fight between uh, superpowers, and you will miss the point. So, in order not to miss the woods for the trees, I wanted to trace back the history of colonialism in the Naga Hills first before we look at the Battle of Kohima. For all of you who are new to this story, many accounts have been written, both by uh, British anthropologists or you know, uh, later day journalists from uh, the uh, British journalists and American journalists about this particular Battle of Kohima. But none of them mentions the years it took to first uh, establish a political administrative headquarter in the Nada Hills, which was in Kohima. And I hear that tomorrow you are going for a field visit to uh, Sovima here only. So this particular region is the first place which in 1832 onwards, when the British came, they established a police outpost here. It was this rightly named now, renamed Chumukirima. Yeah, it was known as Samguti. So at that point of time, when they came, they were not interested in taking control of the Naga Hills or in fighting the Naga headhunters, but they were interested in protecting their farms in the foothills from the raiding of the Naga tribes. The names given were wild, savage, and uh, headhunters, you know, all the names, juicy names that you can mention were given. So, I wanted to document all these stories in one book, and I, I thought again and again about, you know, how best and who should I address this particular book. So, all these questions were there when I wrote this book. One, everybody knows the name Kohima by now. You know, if you go to uh, Kohima, any one of you, you will know that uh, it's the capital of the state of Nagaland now. But in 1832, there was no place for Kohima. You know, a lot of names in the Naga Hills were given by the Britishers. And the impact of it is both social and political even now. You know, we simplify our description of what is happening today as spillovers of colonial uh, you know, uh, policies which still today impacts our governance, our life, our history. But we don't really investigate into how it happened. So some of the stories needs to be told and therefore I started with what is Kohima? How was it named? It was actually, there was no name called Kohima. Even now there is a uh, place called Kohima village, but that village was also not called Kohima village. So in their own constitution they will say that the name Kohima is derived from uh, the name of a flower called Kevira. So there is a story behind naming of places. For instance, uh, the famous village called Kanuma. There was no 
if you go and ask them what was the origin of the word Konoma, they would say that you know when the British came and attacked Konoma and burned the Konoma village several times because it raised the arm of rebellion against the British invasion. And you know it's uh, known as the famously as the Anglo Konoma War because they fought against the British. And the British took 46 years actually to subdue uh, the Naga Hills at that point of time. Konoma actually is derived from a flower called Kunoria. It's available in abundance in that village. But because the Britishers were very, very, very bad at pronouncing names, they called it Konoma. But in the days to come, because they have written about it in official uh, communications and all that, and it became part of their official parlance, it came to be known as Konoma, and the villagers have accepted it as Konoma. So a lot of names which are given to us, for instance, uh, I am from the Lotha community. The word Lotha is not indigenous to my community. But we have accepted it now, also because all these names today has been institutionalized. I will give you one example. For instance, there is a community called, for instance, uh, the Sumi Naga Trust. Actually, the Constitution of India recognizes the word Sema Naga as a Right. So in your ST category status, it is Sema. But to them, they want to be known as Sumi and they have accepted that because that's their original name. Whereas in the constitution of India, it's still Sema. So a lot of things like that exist today, which are uh, because of the fact that uh, I like to joke about it. You know, I, I don't want to like seriously think about it, but I like to joke about it because it's uh, the violence of naming and renaming people, you know, that affects us daily is because they were very bad at pronouncing our names. Having said that, I can also uh, uh, say that their interest was not in getting your name correct. It was not something they were interested in. They were interested in control, in power over this particular area. This hills, if you look at it, is uh, seemingly insignificant. Seemingly insignificant, insignificant. But for the Britishers to control the tea, the uh, natural resources in Burma and get into trade with China, they had to reach uh, Tamu, which is across Moray in Manipur today. But for that, they'll have to go to Silchar and Maya. Silchar, they used to go. They, they, they were taking the routes that the Ahoms took to come to Assam. The Burmese took to come to Assam. So they wanted to use, uh, they were using that route, but they wanted to use a shorter route. So in search of a shorter route, this national highway that you could see, which goes to Kohima and from Kohima to Infa, was the route they sort of surveyed. So the initial survey was done by British East India Company Army officials. And this started in 1832. So from Silchar they went to Imphal, from Imphal they came up via all the Naga hills to this place, Samagutis. This is Chumugiti Mountain. So that route that they surveyed at that point of time changed the course of uh, the history of Naga hills. So in, sometimes we like to look at, you know, for instance, the practice of head hunting. What was the philosophy behind it? What was the idea behind head hunting? Why was it a practice that defined the Naga culture? You know, all those questions that I wanted to ask, I wanted to address by you know writing about it. I gave you you know two chapters. One is Koima, and I think the other one is chapter nine uh, to read. And before we go to you know even the uh, Second World War, you have to understand the whole dynamics of this. A lot of times we read in national media because of the incident in uh, uh, Manipur, because of the issue in Manipur. We read in national media a lot of interpretations by journalists and a lot of uh, political commentators as well, uh, experts, so to say, on this matter. However, you know, that, uh, one thing that I see which is common in all their assessment and analysis is that. We want to remove history from our assessment of you know, the present. And therefore, it is important that if you want to actually understand 
what is this region? What happened in the past? How did it contribute to you know the greater uh, mm, ideas of nation nation states in this region? You have to look at all these aspects of our history. One, when the Britishers came, we were still using thousand spears, which is like a javelin and a <laughs> tau you would know by now. So this was our weapons. The British actually looked at it with uh, amusement because they had superior weapons. And uh, in their quest to uh, suppress and conquer the so-called savage wild Nagas, they used superior weapons. So technology over uh, the superior technology over the native technology. Something which I uh, write in my chapter 7 where I say when guns replaced the spears. So a lot of fight happened, a lot of raids happened, you know, because for the Nagas, any sort of uh, objection to the way of life was seen as a challenge. I say this because when the Angami Nagas went to Sile, to Chittakong and all for, uh, you know, to trade in sleeves and, you know, uh, sold, which was the two main, uh, main items that they treated. They were thwarted or stopped and arrested or harassed by the British uh, soldiers. And then there was something which was not acceptable. So for them, any negotiation, if you look at all the negotiations that happened, all the discussions that happened between the British uh, soldiers and the uh, different, different Naga villages which raided this area, you would find that the negotiations were always temporary. It was always top gap in arrangement. But there was no intention from both the sides to actually have a agreement which is permanent. Also, also because maybe there was no such thing as a concept of permanent agreement at that point of time. So, I like to highlight one of the key key factors in the entire uh, history at that point of time. In 1826. There is a treaty called the Treaty of Yandam, which was signed between the Burmese and the British. I mean, I'm just simplifying it. It actually ensured the control of British Empire of this entire region, north of Bengal uh, and northeast of Bengal. And at that point of time, they used a lot of the indigenous, you know, the, the local rulers here. One of the main characters is Gambir the Maharaja of uh, Manipur. He was uh, <coughs> actually supported by the British to raise a levy, an army called the Manipur Levy. It was also known as uh, Maharaja Gambir Singh Levy of about 500 uh, soldiers. And this was because he was used to drive away the Burmese occupation of Infa or Manipur at that point. So, you know, the geograph geographies of uh, every region has changed over the years. Uh, Post-independence, a lot of things have changed. But before that, during the colonial period, this when the Maharaja was uh, sort of armed, he never had this uh, intention of uh, uh, submitting to the British Empire. But he was using it as an opportunity to strengthen his own uh, uh, you know, army so that he could not only drive away the uh, British Empire are uh, these Burmese uh, rulers. The Burmese had come and occupied Manipur and for seven years, it's known as the year of devastation in Manipur. Because for seven years, the Métis were tortured, were enslaved, were made to work for the Burmese and they were uh, subjected to uh, inhuman living conditions by the Burmese. So to overthrow that, the Manipuri king Gambir Singh actually took the help of the British, raised the army and drove them out. So in driving them away, they had an arrangement with the British and, and I actually have three chapters of it. But why I mention Gambir Singh is because having said that, you know, he was known for his efficient administration but as a military strategist, he was not only a uh, uh, brilliant strategist but he was a brutal uh, in, in terms of uh, his treatment of his captured subjects. He was a brutal 
military general. So when he came to Kohima around that time in 1833, and when he sort of uh, captured two kills of Kohima village, which I uh, document here, he, in the tradition of Mete kings, when you conquer a place, actually even in uh, Mandele, you will find uh, his great grandfather, who was called Garib Niwas, um, had after conquering the place, put in, uh, you know, they they they, they install a stage, uh, I mean, I forgot the exact word, but they install a stone. Sorry, they install a stone where, or above the grave of a, you know, they they bury a boy alive and they put a they put a stone on top of that. So that's their symbol of you know, having conquered or defeated a place. So they did that in Kohima. If you go to Kohima, you will still see that stone uh, in the Kohima Museum. Uh, they say that it was washed away, this is a replica and all that, but uh, I, since, uh, I recently took a photo of it uh, before it gets lost. And the tradition that we want to capture is that, so those days, at the center of every interaction, I think uh, violence was uh, the main agency. I particularly, you know, today if we are to comment of uh, comment on the present uh, day situation, concerns of many Naga uh, peacemakers about ending fetishized killings and, uh, and and bringing about permanent peace and all. So you know, if you look at it, if you just expand that particular concept. Those days, it was one village against the other. Uh, brutal, uh, you know, uh, uh, when a village is attacked, brutal retaliation was executed. And even this king had shown that, but he was used by the British Empire to actually subjugate, uh, you know, to try and subjugate the, uh, the Naga tribes in this part of the world. I just wanted to highlight this because I felt that in many of the narratives, there is a disconnect between that particular chapter of Naga history in the Naga Hills, where the British took about 46 years to actually establish a, a political headquarters here. Because they were finally convinced of the fact that they have to politically control this area. Because if they don't do, their economic interest in the foothills of Assam and Nagaland will be, uh, I mean, would not be safeguard because Nagas will raid, attack their tea gardens, attack their, you know, the fledgling coal and oil mining industry. And this particular aspect is very important because it is based on that particular factor that they inflicted a violent and Possibly the most, uh, um, you know, at that point of time, for uh, unacceptable to all the villages, the most uh, imposing control over the Naga Hills. Most of the scholars today, especially military scholars, uh, war historians, as they call it, would like to ignore this particular period because. It is not a rosy uh, chapter. A lot of British officers were also killed by uh, Arnaga warriors, and I have documented some of it. There's a place called Bounty, I think you read in the chapter 9. Yeah, so where. Uh, very ingenious. So where uh, you would uh, find that the villagers had killed uh, a cap a Captain Butler. So in the cover of this book is Captain Butler. I have, uh, this is by R.G. Woodward who accompanied him and who went after the killing of Butler, he actually burned down the granaries in the village and the whole village and he punished the villagers by taking them to Bolaka in Assam to actually dig uh, water ponds there as a, as a form of punishment. 
So the history of that colonial period is a history of violence, oppression. And the other aspect which generally, you know, in, in our school, we don't read about our own history. So if we had read about our own history, we would have a sense of, you know, what happened. And, and it's, uh, uh, it's a good place to start, actually. But that was not part of our curriculum. So I felt that maybe because we don't have books uh, for our, uh, you know, people to read, and I should write about it. That part of history, if I look at it, is something which is very significant for all of us. Now, then later on, after establishing their headquarter, they expanded their control, and um, as uh, our moderator has said, Christianity came uh, only after after the colonial uh, uh, administration took over uh, the Naga Hills. And uh, later on, in uh, 1944, when the Battle of Goyma happened, people are actually surprised that the Nagas were surprised by the British, took the sides of the British and not the Japanese. Although the Japanese had come with a lot of promise and, uh, um, you know, <coughs> uh, sort of uh, support for a fledgling cry of the Naga people for, uh, at that point of time, independence from the British Empire. So I think the alignment did not take place at that point of time. Today, I have partly uh, highlighted the issue of AZ Tizo, the Nava uh, national leader, and Subhas Chandra Bose, and how they were supported or they supported the Japanese Imperial Army uh, in this battle. Uh, when uh, you read the review, you will find that uh, you know, the fact that the British Museum considered the Battle of Weimar as uh, the greatest battle in their history is something which uh, the Naga people also take as a badge of honor, although uh, there's no critical appraisal to that kind of, uh, you know, uh, say category or, you know, categorization. However, we need to critically think about our history, our past, and look at all this history from, uh, you know, the present day problems. As a uh, legislator, I faced a lot of issues in the present state of Nagaland where uh, I felt that all of it, all of this were actually a spillover of the colonial uh, legacy. And uh, we are still dealing with uh, and grappling with some of the problems and therefore in order to actually uh, address those problems, not necessarily solve it, we need to go back to our history. So that was one of the reasons why I want to bring out this book and show and also tell that our story was like that and today we are in this position because of that uh, particular aspect of our history which we have forgotten or not cared to read. Because most of the books that are available are scholarly or sometimes only people doing PhD read about it and in order to bring and engage the masses we need to uh, tell our stories and I have written it in the form of stories as a uh, literature student, I'm <laughs> interested in storytelling more than uh, writing a treatise. So, you know, that's one of the approach I took. Uh, finally, I would encourage you to uh, see if some of the narrative that I have put across, because, you know, the, the, the nuances of history are many, <laughs> are acceptable to the presence generation, whether we should actually debate those issues, those stories, and relate it with our present generation's uh, you know, problems. So these are some of the challenges I uh, look into, and I, you know, because I say that this is a uh, dialogue we want to have, I want to leave it and uh, extend more time to the Q&A and interaction. So with this, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you so much for having me.